Players from 140 countries were called, but only 24 national teams will be living the dream of the 1994 World Cup. The two-year-long qualifying process was a nightmare for several of the perennial powers, as France and all four teams from the United Kingdom failed to qualify for the first time since World War II. A new world order has come to World Cup football, and with it, new players from new countries. But qualifying for the World Cup is much more than a game. I'm correspondent Mike Saray. Join me on a journey into the heart and soul of World Cup soccer. This summer, the United States will have an opportunity to see what all the excitement's about firsthand when it hosts soccer's main event, the World Cup. Hello, I'm Mike Saray. At stake, who's the best in the world? The field, 24 national teams from across the globe who survived the unforgiving qualifying process. The World Cup can so dominate a nation's consciousness as to be unimaginable to us here in the United States. What is it that fuels this incredible passion for this childhood game? Join me on a journey into the heart and soul of soccer. Zambia in Southern Africa is a country rich in natural attractions, but too poor to support most organized sports. Soccer is the world's most popular sport, primarily because everybody plays it everywhere. All you need is some open space and a ball. But here in Southern Africa, you can't even take the ball for granted. So this is the official Zambian football, a masterpiece in recycling of old paper, plastic, twine, cloth, anything it can to make a ball. It's amazingly symmetrical and quite lively. Immortalized in Zambia folk songs, the 1993 Zambian national football team was this African Republic's dream team. Many of them helped upset the Italian national team in the Olympics. They were destined to be the first Southern African team ever to qualify for the World Cup. I was supposed to join the team on Thursday. Their captain, Kalusha Bwila, was playing in Europe between qualifying matches and planning to rejoin his teammates flying to their next qualifying match in Senegal. After it's really done, he's going to Atawata. Yes. For reasons still unknown, the Zambian team plane exploded in midair and crashed into the sea off the west coast of Africa in Gabon. All 30 players, coaches, and officials aboard, plus 8 million Zambians' World Cup dreams, went down with the plane. My, my dreams died with the boys. Who will this country send now to advance the cause of the fallen hero? Who will stand up with greater devotion? Yes, today we inter the remains of our hero. But we most certainly do not inter their dreams. Father, I thank you. I thank you, God. Zambian President Chaluba's grief and the country's was overwhelming. Many people couldn't go to work. Others couldn't sleep. The entire nation was paralyzed by its tragic loss and bitter disappointment. In a nationally televised funeral service at Lusaka Stadium, Zambia's dream team was buried. In a memorial, in the shadow of the stadium where they had not lost a game in five years. As a living memorial to the players, and in an effort to bring Zambia back to normal life, Kalusha Bwila helped organize a new Zambian team, made up of players cut from the original national team. World Cup officials delayed Zambia's remaining qualifying matches for two months. The British government donated the services of Ian Porterfield, a no-nonsense first division coach from England. In their first rescheduled match against the World Cup veterans from Morocco, they shocked themselves and Africa by coming from behind in the second period to win two to one on goals by Kalusha and Johnson Wyla. Allow me to present to you the lineup for this afternoon. In the following weeks, football announcer Dennis Luwe chronicled the resurrection of both a team and a country as Zambia's hopes were rekindled. We picked up the lads literally from the streets. And when they were training and trotting, we said, that's the spirit. No, 
There is no defeat in the Zambian vocabulary. It's all victory. Literally from the president downward, we become one people. No party differences, no tribal differences, no religious differences. We just become Zambia. Beautiful party. After the Zambians shut out South Africa, everyone, including the president, started to talk again about going to the World Cup. The boys have come forward, and the dream is being held. The mantle is still flying high. I'm sure we'll do it. After tying two of their games on the road, qualifying for the World Cup was within their grasp if they could win their last home game against Senegal and finish with a draw in Morocco. We are going to move into this game as if the entire world, as if life itself depends upon it. There will be no surrender. Every stadium is sacred ground for somebody, but everyone who comes to play football here in Lusaka has to come past this sacred ground. The memorial for those killed in the plane crash. The Zambians like to pass by here before every game because it helps them focus on the real purpose of their efforts. Their opponents don't even want to come here. In fact, Senegal is afraid of coming here because they say instead of playing 11 Zambians, we'll be playing 30. Predominantly Christians, Zambians' faith in God and the miraculous resurrection of their national football team was a popular sermon on Sundays before their qualifying matches. For those believing in traditional spirits, there are witch doctors like Dr. Mumsda, who uses bones and stones for divine inspiration and for the right price, a timely prediction. It shows two goals to zero. Zambia two, Senegal zero. For the afternoon match against Senegal, the fans started arriving at the stadium just after dawn. There are no reserved seats at Lusaka Stadium. The price of a good seat is a long day in the African sun. They also come early to pay homage to their dream team. Here comes the presidential motorcade. So they are reaching the graveyard, the royal graveyard. After passing by the graves of their fallen comrades, the president leads the team bus into the stadium for what appears to be a victory lap. Less a sign of overconfidence, it is more a symbolic summoning of the country's collective will and spirit to keep the World Cup dream alive. Prior to the game, the superstitious Senegalese refused to warm up near the end of the stadium closest to the graves. During the game, Senegal barely crossed the midfield line into Zambian territory. Kalusha and his second team continued to play beyond everyone's expectations, as if they truly were on a mission. By shutting out Senegal 4 to nothing, Zambia moved to within a game of doing what not even the dream team might have done live out Zambia's dreams of playing in their first World Cup. All they needed was a draw in their rematch in Morocco. The television reception from Morocco was bad. More ominously, the referee was from Gabon, where their Zambia's Cinderella story ended in controversy over the officiating as Morocco broke a scoreless tie in the final minutes, cut short one of sport's most emotional comebacks and claimed the World Cup invitation. Announcer Dennis Luwe led Zambia's official protest to have the match replayed. Unlike the sports cliche, in Zambia, qualifying for the World Cup really was a matter of life and death. While the country waited in vain for a rematch, young Zambians kept recycling their paper and plastic bags to make more Zambian footballs for a World Cup dream that will never die.